Hello everyone and welcome back. It's Black Friday right now and there's discounts everywhere. And with that being said, you most likely need some electronics to go in your remote control snowmobile, don't you? So, what should you get? Well, a lot of people don't know. So, in this video I'm gonna explain why you need specific electronics, what should you get, and what budget you should expect for that kind of electronics. So, let's break it down into smaller chunks. Let's start with the battery. If you want the cheapest option, I would suggest that you go with a nickel metal hydride or NIMH battery. This is the cheapest stuff, really doesn't require a lot of attention from the user. You just, you plug it in, you use it. Once it is charged, you can just let it in the machine, you can unplug it, you can charge it, it doesn't matter. It can take a beating. The other type is a lithium polymer battery. And that requires some attention. You need to make sure that the battery, once it's fully discharged or fully charged, and you don't want to use it for a couple of days, you need to bring it to a state that's called storage mode. That's important because if you don't do that, the battery is going to degrade over time and it's not going to have the same effect and performance. And the other thing is that it might be dangerous because the battery might be puffing up. That's one of the downsides of using a lithium polymer battery. But the trade-off is you gain a lot of capacity and performance for the same amount of weight and it's usually in a smaller package as well. So you decided you want to install a lithium battery. What should you get? Well. Let's start with the voltage. You have a few different options. Every quote unquote cell is roughly 3.7 volts. Can be higher, can be lower, but that's uh, the nominal voltage. So if you have a two cell battery, that's 7.4 volts. If you have a three cell battery, that's 11.1 volts and so on and so forth. So usually for the one seven scale snowmobile, I recommend to go between a 2S and a 3S battery. Anything more than that and you're asking for trouble because of the heat, the power and all that sort of stuff. A 2S LiPo will usually be a lot lighter because you save 50% of the weight of one of the packs of a 3S. So it's usually a lighter option, but it doesn't deliver as much power usually. So that brings us to the second important factor, which is the capacity. Normally for the 1.7 scale snowmobile, I recommend something around 1500 milliamp hour to 2200 milliamp hour. You can go it a little bit more than that, but if you do, usually the battery doesn't fit in a snowmobile. It's better sometimes to have two small battery and swap halfway through rather than having a one big battery that supplies enough voltage for 15, 20, 30 minutes. The last important thing you need to look out for is the C rating or the discharge rating. If you have a 30 C discharge, well, you do 30 times your capacity. So if it's a 2000 milliamp hour battery, you do 30 times two and that's 60 amps. So that means that in theory, your battery can discharge 60 amps. Now, if you have a higher C rating or a higher capacity, that means you can supply more to the rest of the electronics and it will increase the power. Also, often a higher C rating means the battery is a higher quality battery. It's always a good idea to go with a higher C rating rather than trying to cheap out on some cheaper stuff that's gonna let you down down the road. So now that you have selected what kind of battery you want to use, I suggest that you move on to the speed controller because the speed controller and the battery are directly connected one to another. So it's useless to use a 300 amp ESC if the battery you have can only supply 60 amps. Now, of course, it's gonna run cooler and it's gonna be more efficient and you know, all that sort of stuff. But the baseline is if your battery can only output 60 amps, you should get something like 90 amps on the ESC or 120 just to be on the safe side, but it's useless to go to 160, 170 amps, kind of useless to go higher than that. But also, if you go lower than 60 amps, you might burn your ESC out. The ESC, or electronic speed controller, is the device that takes the voltage from the battery and makes it usable to the three-phase motor. You cannot plug the battery directly to the motor because the battery supplies DC voltage and the motor uses AC voltage. So you need something in between to modulate the power. And that's why it's called a speed controller. So let's say that your battery is a 3S 2200 milliamp hours. That means you can output something like 70 amps constant. It's not burst, it's, it's only constant. Then that means your speed controller should not be below 60 amps or 70 amps of output power. In my experience, I would not go with a speed controller that's under 60 amps just because usually it's cheaper stuff and it doesn't last quite as long. Also, when you get to more expensive speed controller, oftentimes it comes with more features. Example, telemetry, all metal speed controller with a nice fan and keeps everything cool. Or sometimes you can program it with a programming card that comes with the speed controller. I highly recommend that you invest in a programming card because oftentimes 
the speed controller and the rotation of the motor will spin backward. The other important thing is that your speed controller can either be a sensor unit or a sensor-less unit. The difference is that the sensor will know the position of the motor, it will know exactly what coil to give the power to, and it will send it directly, so you won't have any hesitation or jerk before it starts. Of course, having that feature brings up the price, but it's, in my opinion, one of the most important thing in having a remote control snowmobile is the precision sometimes you need to turn slowly around a corner to make sure you don't sink or you don't go too fast or you trench or whatever. So, in my opinion, a censored system, if you can afford it, is definitely something I recommend you invest into if you have the money for it. The last important thing in the system is the motor. Now, the battery supplies the voltage and the power. The speed controller can only use so much of that battery and supply to bring it to the motor. So the three items are interconnected together and that's why they need to be balanced in order to have the maximum amount of power. The motor can take as much power as you can throw at it. It will overheat and it will over rev if you push too much through it, but there's no hard limit on, oh, a motor can only take so many. No, a motor can take everything you throw at it. If you plug a motor in the wall, it will eventually fail because it overheats the wire, but it will spin for half a second or just burst into a big ball of flame. One of the other, don't try this at home. The motor is actually quite simple. It's only three wires leading to three coils. And sometimes you have a sensor port for the sensor system we talked about a second ago, but it's basically just three wires giving the power to it. So if you have a non-sensor unit and you want to flip the rotation, you just switch two of the wires. And if you have a sensor system, you need to do it in software of the speed controller. So that means you need to either have a programmable ESC with a button or have a programming card or plug it to the computer, one of the options. That's why it's important oftentimes to have a higher quality one because you have more option and flexibility regarding the settings that you want to put into it. Not all motors are equal. A very important factor when you're buying a brushless motor is the KV rating. The KV rating is the RPM per volt. So if you have a 3,800 KV motor, that means it's gonna run 3,800 RPMs per volt. So if you have a 10 volt system, well, just do times that. And that's gonna give you around 38,000 RPMs. If you have a lower KV or a higher KV, that number is gonna change. If you have a higher voltage over the battery or a lower battery voltage, it will also change and affect the performance. That being said, there's something also known as the T rating, which is the number of winding of the motor. It's the same thing as the KV, but put in a different uh, measurement system. It's the number of time the coil is wired. A lower T rating will result in a higher KV rating, which results in a higher RPM motor. So if you have a lower T rating, the motor will spin faster. There's a middle ground. I don't recommend that you go with a 2.5 turn motor because that would mean your motor would spin at 9,000 kV or 9,000 RPMs per volt. Well, first of all, your motor is gonna overheat like instantly. And the other thing is that the RPM might make the rotor implode. So there is a middle ground. Normally a 10.5 turn is a sweet spot for a 3S LiPo and a 7.5 turn or 4.5 turn minimum is good for a 2S setup. I would also suggest having a 17.5 turn motor or applications where you don't need as much power but want some cooler temperatures and run for longer with the same battery. If your motor has more turns or a lower KV, usually the motor is more efficient so it doesn't go through the battery as quickly. So this is all something you need to keep in mind. The RC snowmobiles I built often rely on a 540 size class motor. So that's a 36 millimeter diameter can by roughly 50 or 60 millimeters long. That's the typical 110th scale brushless system. Let's say that you want to have a system for yourself and you don't have a lot of money to put in an expensive system with lots of feature. What should you get? Well, oftentimes Obbywing makes some great products for a decent price and have some decent amount of options as well. I would go for possibly a Hobbywing Just Stock. It's a great speed controller, can handle a lot of power and you can program it a bit. I would also suggest that you get the programming card for it. The Hobbywing Max 10 is also a great option for beginners. It might even be a better option because it has variable timing unlike the Just Stock. The timing of a brushless system can vary just like the timing on an internal combustion engine. If you give it more timing, it will have a higher RPM, but it will lose in efficiency, but gain in RPMs and overall power. I would also look at the OMG Polaris speed controller. Yes, it says Polaris. It's very fitting of a Polaris. But anyways, it's a good 
speed controller, I believe. And it also can output a decent amount of power. I would also look at the Spectrum lineup of speed controllers. There's some good entry level options with some decent features. If you go all Spectrum, that's something I would look into. The quick run lineup from Hobbywing is also a decent option but I would not go below that in terms of price. Usually if you go on the internet and try to look for a brushless system, I know you will find some options for like $50 uh, for a combo with a speed controller and a motor. I would definitely not go with this. I've seen people systems go and smoke inside their machine because they cheaped out on a speed controller and a motor combo just after plug it in. So give yourself a favor, get a system that at least if you don't want to use a couple of years down the line, at least you can resell it for a decent price and you will have also good experience while you do have it in your snowmobile. So my baseline is I would not go below 50, 60, 70 dollars for a speed controller by itself. Now if it comes with a combo with a motor, again, uh, give maybe 30, 40, 50 bucks for a motor for entry level, that's gonna get you somewhere I believe. That's a, a decent start. For batteries, I like to use some Gen Zace battery because they're uh, usually a good price and they're, I'm, I'm always impressed by the quality of the batteries. It's always very good packs. Uh, they last a long time for me. I always like my experience using the Gen Zace battery. So that's my go-to for lithium batteries. If you want to use some nickel metal hydride batteries, uh, I would simply go on Amazon and get a set. Uh, it's it's old technology, so basically anything you can get is probably gonna be a decent contender. Just don't get the cheapest stuff there is, you know, common sense. I'm sure you can find something that's gonna fit your budget and that's gonna perform well. For lithium, I don't really have a minimum price, but if you can get something that has a decent C rating and it has the voltage and capacity that you want and the size it fits and all that, well, go for it. There's no hard limit, uh, but of course, once again, don't get the cheapest stuff and you will generally be pretty satisfied with what you get. If you want your speed controller and motor to be a bit more on the high-end stuff, I would recommend the Castle Creation System, the Castle 1410 motor. Pretty awesome little motor, lots of power, lots of torque, possibly Tekken. Uh, I love Tekken products. They've been treating me pretty good so far. Never had a, a Tekken speed controller or a motor failure. Pretty satisfied with the brand. Uh, for speed controllers, Again, I would, I would both go for Tekin or Castle Creations. What I really like is that you can do some data logging and know exactly how much power you've used during the run you did. Um, I'm personally using a Mamba XLX, that's version one. It was the most powerful speed controller there was at one point. And that's the power system that I have in Decagon. It's, it's got more than enough juice to power the system. Now for one seven scale snowmobile, I wouldn't go above uh, probably a Mamba X, I think is a decent little option. It's all metal speed controller. It's a very good speed controller overall. Uh, I would go for something like that. Um, also, they now have the Copperhead, which is basically a Mamba X, but a bit cheaper and plastic casing instead. But uh, from what I've heard, it's a pretty decent contender as well. Uh, and also the SCT combo. So the, the SCT combo is a two in one with a motor and usually I think a, co a cooling fan as well. Uh, if I would have to pick a system for 90% of builds, I would probably get that SCT combo system from Castle Creation. Great motor, great speed controller, and uh, it get, gets you pretty far for a very good price. If you want to, you can also be uh, shopping while looking at the specs of the speed controllers and motor. So you can look at the maximum input voltage, the maximum output voltage from you know amperage point of view. What I did for Shotkey is go shopping for uh, weight. So I was looking at the lightest options from a couple of manufacturers and I landed up of, uh, over a few different speed controllers and then I looked into power figures and that's how I selected my much more racing fleet. Uh, but uh, it's, it's a very awesome speed controller. It's really expensive too, but it's an awesome speed controller. Highly recommended for the price. It's, it's, the, it's Of course it's expensive, but Great performer, lots of feature, very satisfied with that. Oftentimes racing speed controller or drifting, drifter speed controller uh, gives you a lot of options and tuning features that other speed controllers can't. So that's also something you can keep an eye out while shopping for that. Now let's talk about radio system for transmitter and receiver for your snowmobile. So transmitters, receiver is basically the stuff that you hold in your hand and the receiver in the snowmobile. They communicate together and if you pull the trigger to go forward, that's going to send a signal for the snowmobile to go forward. So, usually 
Uh, there's a few different systems that I recommend, some that I say stay away from. So let's start at the beginning. Uh, oftentimes what I really like to use is Spectrum because they have a wide diversity of radios for a whole bunch of different prices. One of the best radios I've ever had was a DX2E. Uh, it was the version with uh, the silicone grip. I love that radio. It's, it felt really comfortable. It's really cheap. Feels like a good quality transmitter and uh, it never failed me. I would highly recommend something like that for entry level. For a more high-end experience, uh, definitely the DX5 Rugged. It's waterproof, it's shockproof. You really can't go wrong with that transmitter. I loved every second of having it on shot key. That was just the perfect fit for the snowmobile. I would highly recommend it. Uh, also for high-end stuff, uh, I know Futaba makes awesome radio. I have a few different radio from them as well. They're all awesome. But if you really like to save, uh, save your money for something that's just gonna do the job and no extra bells and whistles, something like a Fly Sky FS GT3. I think it's a good transmitter. It has a few different features. It has an LCD screen, which is nice for that price point. I have one of these transmitters and it's been treating me well as well. If you want something that's sort of low budget, but still has a, a few different features, I would look into the Spectrum DX3 Smart. Uh, it's a pretty nice radio that has the option of knowing what the battery voltage is, assuming that you have Spectrum batteries and also Spectrum uh, Firma lineup. Last but not least, we have steering servos. So this one varies a lot because if you have a Yamaha Viper, if you use my conversion kit, I have a conversion kit to use a small MG90S because it's metal gears uh, and you can get a bunch of them on Amazon for really, really cheap. I've had one fail on me, but a bag of them is so cheap that it's really not that much of a loss if you do break one. The other snowmobiles usually use a full size 110 scale servo. Yeah, oftentimes the 24 kilogram servos of Amazon really do the job really well. They're all, of course, metal gears. They're quite cheap and they can take a beating, so that's a very good pick. They're not the fastest, they're not the strongest, but it gets you where you need to go. If you want something that's a bit more high-end, maybe a bit lighter, there are some other options from Futaba, uh, High Tech, all these other brands that offer great products. So where can you get all these electronics? Well, my go-to place in Canada is Great Hobbies. They have a lot of stuff there usually. Uh, it's been getting a bit worse because of the COVID pandemic and all that, but they usually have a lot of options. They have everything I need most of the time. And if they don't have it in stock, they can always order it. And within a few days, uh, they get it there and they ship it my place. Um, if they really can't have anything uh, or if it's back ordered or discontinued, I look up on aiminhobbies.com. That's a US dealer and they have so much stuff there, it's, an, it's, it's unbelievable. That's where I got most of the stuff for Shotkey because it was sort of fancy stuff, especially the speed controller and the programming card, but they had that in stock and it's a great little unit and I got it for a decent price. And then in the rarest of situation, if I really need something specific and it's back order everywhere, uh, if it's not available at Great Hobbies or Aiming Hobbies or sometimes even Horizon Hobbies, if none of those have it, Sometimes you can find it at RC Mart. That's a Chinese distributor. Uh, of course, it comes from around the globe, but they do have some price that are very interesting sometimes. And yes, you pay for duty and uh, taxes and all that, but oftentimes if you can't find it anywhere else, it's gonna be available there. And of course, there's also the Amazon website, which also has a lot of stuff. And sometimes you can find some, uh, maybe motor cooling fans or something like that. Oh, and by the way, side accessories. Um, with that motor, you often need a really good cooling fan just because the more heat you can get away from the motor, the best it will run, the more efficient, and you have less chance of melting the motor mount or doing something to the internals. Generally, the cooler the motor, the best. So, um, I would suggest a Yeah Racing fan. It, they have awesome products or Anything that is high speed cooling fan 540 size motor is gonna be a good option. So I'm gonna list a few here. So I hope you find this video useful. I know it's a long video and oftentimes people don't watch these long videos, but I feel like it's a really important topic. Hopefully pick up a thing or two. If it was useful, don't forget to let me know by dropping a like or something like that, maybe a comment. I read all the comments. I'm really happy when you do that. So that's it. Uh, thanks for watching. And by the way, since you're there completely at the end, I have a 15% off discount for the Black Friday of the season and it's live till December 1st. 
So thanks for watching and I will catch you next time. Thanks for riding with me. A question that I receive pretty often is, can I reuse my stock transmitter and electronics? And the answer is no, because uh, these newer electronics, they work as an ecosystem. So you cannot reuse the stock transmitter and receiver and battery because they are their own ecosystem and you cannot cross communicate at all. So if you do pull the trigger on a new system, you need to get everything new. Uh, if you don't have a lot of money, oftentimes what you can do is go on the used market and get a used ready to run unit like a old Traxxas Slash or a Bandit. I had an ECX Torment once and it has some great electronics inside so I resold uh, the roller chassis and I kept the electronics and uh, I had these electronics ever since. That's where I got my DX2E. So, good stuff.